An Introduction to Islamic Law by Wa'il B. Halak Chapter 1 Who's Who in the Sharia? In modern legal systems, judges, lawyers, and notaries are unquestionably products of the legal profession. They are initially educated in elementary and secondary schools that are regulated by the state and their education in the law schools from which they eventually graduate is no less subject to such regulation. They study the laws that the state legislates, although in some legal systems they also study the legal decisions of judges who are constrained in good part by the general policies of the state. The point is that the legal profession is heavily regulated by the state and its legal and public policies. It is difficult to think of any legal professional who can go on to practice law without having to pass some sort of exam that is directly or indirectly ordained by the state or its agencies. And when law students become lawyers and lawyers become judges, their ultimate and almost exclusive reference is to law made by the state. This situation would have been inconceivable in Muslim lands before the dawn of modernity. The most striking fact about traditional Islamic legal personnel is that they were not subject to the authority of the state, simply because the state as we know it did not exist. In fact, it did not exist in Europe either, its beginnings there going back to no earlier than the 16th century. Thus, until the introduction to the Muslim world during the 19th century of the modern state and its ubiquitous institutions, Muslims lived under a different conception and practice of government. This is why we must not use the term state to refer to that early form of rule under which Muslims lived prior to the 19th century. Instead, we will reserve for that kind of authority such terms as ruler, rule, or government. Pre-modern Muslim rule was limited in that it did not possess the pervasive powers of the modern state. Bureaucracy and state administration were thin, mostly limited to urban sites, and largely confined to matters such as the army of the ruler, his assistance, tax collection, and often land tenure. People were not registered at birth, had no citizenship status, and could travel and move to other lands and regions freely, there being no borders, no passports, no nationalities and no geographic fixity to residential status. A Kyrene family, for example, could migrate to Baghdad without having to apply for immigration and without having to show documentation at borders, because, as I said, there were neither borders, nor fixed at any rate, nor passports in the first place. And the farther people lived from the center of rule, the less they were affected by the ruler his armies and his will to impose certain order, or even taxes on them. And the reason for this was simple. In order for the ruler to have complete control over faraway regions, he had to send armies and government officials whose cost of maintenance may not always have been covered by the tax they levied from the populations under their control. So, if there was no state to regulate society and the problems that arose in it, then how did people manage their affairs? The short answer is self-rule. Communities, whether living in city quarters or villages, regulated their own affairs. If the civil populations felt it necessary to have a ruler, it was because of the specific need for protection against external enemies, be they raiding tribes, organized highway robbers, or foreign armies who might wreak havoc on them and play havoc with their lives. But the civil populations did not need the ruler to regulate their own internal affairs. Since such regulations were afforded by a variety of, of internal mechanisms developed over centuries by their own local communities. Customary law was an obvious source of self-regulation, but the Sharia was equally as important. This is to say that the Sharia was not the product of Islamic government, unlike modern law which is significantly the product of the state. It is true that the Muslim ruler administered justice by appointing and dismissing judges, even defining the limits of their jurisdictions, 
but he could in no way influence how and what law should apply. So, the question before us is, if the Muslim ruler did not create the law of the land, who did? The answer is that society and its communities produced their own legal experts, persons who were qualified to fulfill a variety of functions that, in totality, made up the Islamic legal system. For now, we will speak in a limited fashion and by the way of an introduction of four types of legal personnel who played fundamental roles in the construction, elaboration, and continued operation of the Sharia. These are the Mufti, the author jurist, the judge, and the law professor. Of course, there were other players in the legal system, including the notaries, the court witnesses, and even the ruler himself, to be discussed in due course. But their role in the construction of the system and its continuing operation was not structural, by which I mean that the system would have remained much the same with or without their participation. But without the fundamental contributions of mufti, author jurist, judge, and law professor, the Sharia would not have its unique features and would not have developed the way it did. These four players, each in his own way, made the Sharia what it is. We begin with the Mufti because of his central role in the early evolution of Islamic law and his or her important contribution to its continued flourishing and adaptability throughout the centuries. The Mufti, performing a central function, was a private legal specialist who was legally and morally responsible to the society in which he lived, not to the ruler and his interests. The Mufti's business was to issue a fatwa, namely a legal answer to a question he was asked to address. As a rule, consulting him was free of charge, which means that legal counsel was easily accessible to all people, poor or rich. Questions addressed to the Mufti were raised by members of the community, as well as by judges who found some of the cases brought before their courts difficult to decide. The first legal elaborations that appeared in Islam were the product of this question-answer activity. With time, these answers were brought together, augmented, systematized, and eventually transmitted in memory as well as in writing as law books. The Mufti stated what the law was with regard to a particular factual situation. As he was, because of his erudition, considered to have supreme legal authority, his opinion, though non-binding, nonetheless settled many disputes in the courts of law. Regarded as an authoritative statement of law, the fatwa was routinely upheld and applied in the courts. A disputant who failed to receive a fatwa in his or her favor was not likely to proceed to court and would instead abandon his or her claim altogether or opt for informal mediation. Muftis did not always sit in court, but this did not change the fact that they were routinely consulted on difficult cases, even if they resided at several days distance from where the case was being decided. It was not unusual that a judge, say in Cairo, would send a letter containing a question to a mufti who lived, for instance, in Muslim Spain. The authority of the fatwa was decisive. When on occasion the fatwa was disregarded, it was usually because another fatwa, often produced by an opponent, constituted a more convincing and better reasoned opinion. In other words, and to put it conversely, it was rare for a judge to dismiss a fatwa in favor of his own opinion, unless he himself happened to be of a juristic caliber higher than that enjoyed by the mufti from whom the fatwa was solicited, in which case the judge himself would not seek a fatwa in the first place. All this is to say that the fatwa is the product of legal expertise and advanced legal knowledge. And the more learned the mufti, the more authoritative and acceptable his fatwa was to both the court and the public. The level of a scholar's legal knowledge was determined through practice, not degrees or diplomas. The measure of a leading jurist was, among other things, the quality of his writings and fatwas 
as well as his ability to win in scholarly debates with distinguished scholars. The central role of the fatwa in the Muslim court of law explains why the decisions of judges were neither kept nor published in the manner practiced by modern courts. In other words, law was to be found not in precedent established by courts of law, a notion based upon the doctrine of stare decisis, but rather in a juristic body of writings that originated mostly in the answers given by muftis. Thus emanating from the world of legal practice, the fatwas, rather than the court decisions, were collected and published, particularly those among them that contained new law or represented new legal elaborations on older problems that continued to be of recurrent relevance. Such fatwas usually underwent a significant editorial process in which legally irrelevant facts and personal details, i.e. proper names, names of places, dates, etc., were omitted. Moreover, they were abridged with a view to abstracting their contents into strictly legal formulas, usually of the hypothetical type. If X does Y under certain set of conditions, then L, legal norm, follows. Once edited and abstracted, these fatwas became part and parcel of the authoritative legal literature to be referred to and applied as the situation required. The great majority of Islamic legal works, however, were written not by the mufti, but rather by the author jurors, who depended in good part on the fatwas of distinguished muftis. The author jurors actively extended from writing short but specialized treatises to compiling longer works, which were usually expanded commentaries on the short works. Thus, a short treatise summing up the law in its full range usually came to about 200 pages and often elicited commentaries occupying as many as 10, 20, or 30 large volumes. It was these works that afforded the author jurists the opportunity to articulate, each for his own generation, a bona fide body of law that reflected both evolving social conditions and the state of the art in law as a technical discipline. The overriding concern of the author jurists was the incorporation of points of law for the most part, fatwas, that had become relevant and necessary to the age in which they were writing. This is evidence in their untiring insistence on the necessity of including in their works much needed legal issues, deemed to be relevant to a contemporary exigencies as well as those issues of widespread occurrence. On the other hand, cases that had become irrelevant to the community and its needs and having thus gone out of circulation, were excluded. Many, if not the majority of the cases retained, were acknowledged as belonging to the later jurisprudence, who had elaborated them in response to the emerging new problems in the community. Reflecting in their writings the changing conditions of people and of the age, the author jurists opted for later opinions that were often at variance with the doctrines of the early masters. It is also instructive that the fatwas that formed the substance of later doctrine were those that answered contemporary needs and had at once gained currency in practice. On the other hand, those opinions that had ceased to be of use in litigation were excluded as weak or even irregular. Many of the works written and published by the author jurists served as standard references for judges who studied them when they were students and consulted them after being appointed to the judiciary. Hence, if the authority of the law resided in the Mufti's opinions and the author jurist's treatises, then the judge, unless he himself was simultaneously a Mufti and or an author jurist, was not expected to possess the same level of expert legal knowledge. This is to say that a person who was a Mufti or an author jurist could usually function as a judge, although a judge who was trained only as a judge could never serve in the capacity of a mufti, nor in that of an author jurist. It is obvious that the business of a judge is to adjudicate disputes, which is indeed the chief task of a modern judge. But this task was only one of many other important duties that the Muslim judge, the Qadi, had to undertake. The Qadi, like the mufti, was a member of the community he served. In fact, Islamic law itself insists 
that a Qadi to qualify for the position has to be intimately familiar with the local customs and way of life in the community in which he serves. With the help of his staff, which we will briefly discuss in due course, he was in charge of supervising much in the life of the community. He oversaw the building of mosques, streets, public fountains, and bridges. He inspected newly constructed buildings and the operation of hospitals and soup kitchens, and audited, among other things, the all-important charitable endowments. He looked into the care afforded by guardians to the orphans and the poor, and he himself acted as guardian in marriages of women who had no male relatives. Moreover, the Qadi oftentimes played the exclusive role of mediator in cases that were not of a strictly legal nature. Not only did he mediate and arbitrate disputes and effect reconciliations between husbands and wives, but he also listened, for example, to the problems dividing brothers who might need no more than an outsider's opinion. Furthermore, the Muslim court was the site in which in important transactions between individuals were recorded, such as the sale of a house, the details of the estate of a person who had died, or a partnership contract concluded between two merchants. At times, a person might approach the court merely to request that it take note of an insult directed at him or her by another, this being the equivalent to building a history in the event a future dispute erupted with that person. Equally important was the social site in which the Qadi and his court functioned. Judges invariably sought to understand the wider social context of the litigating parties, often attempting to resolve conflicts in full consideration of the present and future social relationships of the disputants. Finally, we must say a few words about the law professor. The beginnings of legal education in Islam can in fact be traced back to the muftis who emerged during the last two or three decades of the 7th century as private specialists in the law. They did not have salaries and their interest in the study of law was motivated by piety and religious learning. Around each of these early muftis gathered a number of students and sometimes the intellectually curious who were interested in gaining knowledge of the Quran and the biography of the Prophet Muhammad as an exemplary standard of conduct. These gatherings usually took place in the new mosque that were built in various cities and towns that had come under the rule of Islam. Following the practice of Arab tribal councils when they assembled to discuss important issues, these scholarly gatherings took the form of circles where the Mufti professor would literally sit on the ground, legs crossed, having students and interested persons sit to his left and right in a circular fashion. This was also the physical form that court sessions took. Students did not have to apply formally to study with a professor, although his informal approval to have them join his circle was generally required, as was proper decorum on the part of the student. There were no fees to be paid, except the occasional gift the professor might have received from students or their family members. There were no diplomas or degrees conferred upon graduation, only a license issued by the professor attesting that the student had completed the study of a book that he in turn could transmit or teach to others. The license was personal, having the authority of the professor himself, not that of an impersonal institution as are the degrees granted by today's universities. During the first two centuries of Islam, the distinction between a fatwa assembly and a teaching circle was not always clear-cut or obvious. In fact, to some extent, this situation continued to obtain even throughout the later centuries when a mufti sitting in a circle would announce the end of a fatwa session, would open another session for adjudicating cases, thus acting as a judge and perhaps in the same afternoon, at times, after sharing a meal with his students, would set up yet another circle for teaching. We often read in the sources that many jurists wrote their legal treatises during the night hours, 
and in seclusion, thereby acting in the capacity of author jurist. It must be said that those who acted in all four capacities were usually regarded as among the most accomplished jurists. Some fatwas encountered in a fatwa session might be discussed in the teaching circle, might be discussed in the teaching circle, while some students who participated in the teaching or fatwa circle might act as witnesses when the circle was transformed into a court session. Thus, while these three activities or spheres were different from each other, they were interrelated in several ways. At both the level of student participation and that of professor. If a person could act as a mufti, then he could teach and was certainly qualified to perform the duties of a judge, provided of course that, that he had been appointed as qadi by the ruler or governor. Judges, as government appointees, were financially remunerated by the ruler for their work but not so muftis or professors, with the partial exception of later Ottoman practice, which we will discuss in due course. Still, during the first four or five centuries of Islam, even judges did not hold such appointments full time, and when they did not, had to find, like muftis and professors, other sources of income. That is to say that until the legal profession was institutionalized, the jurists of Islam were not in terms of gaining a livelihood, full-time legal professionals. However, learned and skilled in the law they were. Thus, until the 11th or 12th century, the vast majority of jurors held other jobs, with many of them working as tanners, tailors, coppersmiths, copiers of manuscripts, and small merchants and traders. In other words, they generally belong to what we call today the lower and middle rather than the upper class. End of chapter one.